Now, how about um, toxicity, though, in that study? They saw no evidence of tumor lysis syndrome, clinical or laboratory. The induction mortality, 30-day mortality, was less than 5%. Um, so very well tolerated. Neutropenia, though, is again seen. And I think one of the challenges we now have in using this regimen are around TLS and around managing the myelosuppression. Um, in terms of TLS, um, I think we still have to be quite cautious about using this combination in patients with AML. It's not free of the risk of TLS. I've clearly seen it in my own practice in patients that could have been included in the clinical trial. I've seen LDHs shoot up to you know thousands and creatinine double. Uh, so I think we need to be very cautious and if you're not set up to monitor these patients closely as an outpatient, they should be admitted uh, when you start. Uh, so that's one issue. And remember again, to, you need to have cytal reduction you know, prior to starting this regimen. The second is the neutropenia. Um, oftentimes the marrow is clear of leukemia after the first or second cycle, but the neutropenia will persist um, as long as the patient is taking venetoclax. In our population, we do feel like you need to hold the venetoclax because um, there is persistent count suppression. As you alluded to, we're a little bit more cautious about using myeloid growth factors in a myeloid leukemia. Um, not that there's much proof that it causes refractory disease, but still there is some concern about doing that, especially early on when you haven't seen the response yet. And so I think it's very important for clinicians to know that in many patients, you need to do that marrow at the, um, uh, very early on, day 21 to 28. And if it's clear of disease or cytal reduction, the counts are still low, you need to hold venetoclax. So this is really different than using azacitidine or decitabine, where we just marched on through every 28 days and didn't expect a response for four cycles. And we've all become accustomed to just continuing at full dose. So I think that's the other thing that we have to be very careful about. We don't really have great guidelines of what to do during the maintenance phase with HMA and venetoclax in terms of uh, managing the myelosuppression. Do you shorten the duration of the venetoclax? Do you lower the dose? Do you change the dose or schedule of the HMA? We don't really know. I mean, personally, I have shortened the duration of the venetoclax to allow some count recovery, but really there's um, no um, one way of taking care of this. So I think the clinician just has to be open to this, that they're going to see neutropenia and they have to be able to manage it. And then the final point is, unlike in CLL, AML docs really feel very strongly about using azole antifungals with um, uh, venetoclax, I'm sorry, with induction chemotherapy until the neutropenia goes away. Um, we typically um, will use posaconazole because um, there is a, a label in the prophylactic setting, um, but it's a strong CYPTRA4 inhibitor. Uh, in the phase 1B experience, they did have a small cohort of patients, about 12, who received either, uh, who received posaconazole, the extended release tablets, and the patients received 50 and ramped up to 100. The um, FDA mandated in the label that a dose be picked, the dose that was picked is 70, not because one was better than another, 70 was actually not tested. Um, I don't give 70 because then you have to give two prescriptions, 50 and 20. So I give patients 100 milligrams um, in combination with the azoles. And if they then have a response and aren't very neutropenic, you can stop the azole antifungal. So I think those are some of the things that we need to be careful of. We've been very impressed by the duration of these responses in the phase 1B, the median duration, median survival. At first was estimated to be 18 months, maybe a little shorter in follow-up around 15, 16 months, but still much better than you'd expect with an HMA. Now we're going to see from the phase three study whether there is a survival benefit with the combination over azacitidine alone. Um, I think that remains to be seen. Um, I still think regardless of the survival benefit, getting patients into a remission and having them not require transfusions is definitely a benefit in terms of quality of life. Going back to the TLS risk a little bit, you did allude to the fact that you've, you've seen some TLS in your practice. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular sort of risk factor that has been identified, any kind of risk stratification scheme? Um, 
you know, not that I've seen, it's not like CLL where right. it's been so well worked out. Yeah. Our experience is much, you know, more limited um, with uh, the studies that have been presented. Let's, let's face it, it's less than 100 patients, right, right. with that right. combination. And they've been selected not to have a high burden of disease. Um, where I've seen it has been in older patients, those who appear to have a normal creatinine, but you know they have some renal dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, patients who have uh, some degree of circulating blast, this is where I've seen it. Um, this is where I think we need to be careful. But in all patients, I think even if you treat them as an outpatient, you have to be prepared. Obviously, um, I start these patients all on allopurinol. Now, you, you brought up a very interesting you know, way of um, monitoring patients and uh, being cautious with patients with CLL that you're treating as an outpatient. So first you identify in CLL someone who might be at low risk, but you still will um, do things to try to mitigate um, tumor lysis syndrome and complications. And one of them was before they even come in, take the dose at six in the morning so that by the time they get into the clinic and have labs drawn, you know, it might be noon and you can actually, you know, intervene before the clinic closes. Makes sense. I'm a little bit worried um, in AML that that might not be enough um, because you're seeing very robust activity with a single agent. Um, and I'm not sure if the risk of tumor lysis in AML is really just with the single agent or the combination. And so is it possible that you have the drug on board but it's not until you give the HMA later in the day. Mm. So I still think we have to be very cautious about um, just accepting that what's done in the CLL world will translate easily into AML, and we have to be careful, uh, during, especially during those first few days.